and I'm delighted to welcome Mark Tanner to our interview series. Mark is um, a very, a very um, influential um, adjudicator, composer, uh, ABRSM moderator, also of course concert pianist. Um, Mark is um, also a trustee of EPTA. Now, uh, Mark, it's a lot of titles and um, really, <laughs> really quite quite a few things that you are doing. Um, so tell us a little bit, how has this situation been for you? I mean, um, has it been challenging or positive? Mm. Oh, pleased to meet you, by the way, online. It's just lovely. <laughs> yes. um, well, a mixture of emotions, I suppose, would be the, the, the slightly hedging my bets response to that. But... Um, much of the normal uh, ways that I would interact in the musical world would, of course, as with everybody else, be face to face. Um, so suddenly faced with a dilemma where we're having to sort of digitize everything um, was initially a little bit of a shock because, like a lot of people, I instantly lost a lot of work. Mm -hmm. You know, I was about to go to Turkey, for example, on an ABRSM mm -hmm. um, examining tour, which unfortunately had to be cancelled along with a lot of others. Um, so that suddenly created a kind of vacuum in which other things needed to, to come in. Um, and of course, the open endedness of it, not knowing when it's going to end. We all knew when it started, but we didn't know when it was going to end. And we still don't know when it's going to end. Um, and I think there's a lot of preemptory, uh, rather optimistic discussion going around uh, among people in, in the musical world, assuming that because lockdown is being relaxed in the way it is, that we're somehow sort of on the cusp of normality. And I think this is all rather dangerous, actually. Um, certain things are being released back at a, at a pace that is sensible. Um, but my, my feeling has been that how can I best use the, use the time that I've got, you know? Um, and a lot of the things that I enjoy doing cerebrally, if you like, work just as well, where I'm in a lockdown or not, frankly. I mean, if I'm writing or composing, um, I'd be in this office anyway doing it. Yeah, um, or, or on a cruise ship doing a concert and sitting on deck writing something, you know. So is it really so different um, in terms of the engagement with other people? I think it's when it comes to teaching or adjudicating, examining, um, those things immediately require you to take a completely different sort of take on what you were once doing. And I suppose like everybody else, I've had to find my own solutions to some of these problems, you know. Um, but I, I have to say that um, much of the lockdown period, for me here, where I've been fortunate enough to be in a beautiful place, um, has, has been an enjoyable one. And I, it, it, in a sense, one, one sort of shrinks back from saying this too loudly because of the fact that we are aware of so many people who are having difficulties and struggling yeah. um, in, in the places that they live and with the ever-present danger of the illness, particularly older people, I've got two parents who've just moved into a nursing home. Mm. So I'm very aware of this from the other side of it. Um, but if you're asking me on a day-to-day -day basis whether I've enjoyed the time and the freedom to be able to create things um, from home, then the honest answer is yes, I have much of the time. Mm. You have been busy with, um, you know, your composition. So tell us a little bit about it. Um, well, my, my composing tends to be very much in fits and starts. Um, I'm not a composer who considers, you know, that the, the day starts at nine o'clock in the morning and you kind of work through. I can name various composer friends of mine who do that, who sort of work for X number of hours per day and then they stop for lunch. And then they, um, I tend to compose to brief more. Um, I've got a couple of things that I'm doing at the moment. I'm writing a, um, a quintet for, which is a commission uh, for True Row Three Arts uh, for some students. Um, and that's hopefully going to be performed in December around the Beethoven 250th anniversary date. So I'm just beginning to kind of put together some ideas for that. I've got a friend who is doing a tour of Hamlets to America next year, an actor who has a, a small group and a dozen, dozen actors are essentially playing out the whole of the, the, whole of the play. Um, and I'm writing incidental music for that. So that's kind of dripping into my normal life. If you know, I, I just kind of do it when I feel like doing it really. Um, I please myself. And that's, that's the beauty of being self-employed, isn't it? I mean, sometimes, sometimes you think oh, I'm self unemployed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually I think I'm, I, I like to think that most of the time I'm gainfully employed doing things. Um, and 
my musical day is sort of filled with with pleasurable things. I'm at a stage with in my career where I feel I can say no to things, um, and I enjoy doing what I'm doing. If I stop enjoying it, I stop doing it. Mm. Um, and I appreciate not everybody's in that fortunate position, um, but there we go. You know, it's, it's, how, it's how I fill my day really. So my my, my composing tends to be um, when I know I have a horizon that I need to to fulfil. I know it takes me a while to get around to doing these things, so I just kind of get the, the thought process going. Um, I'm the same when I'm doing my, my, my writing, actually, um, writing books and articles. I try to remove that sense of a deadline encroaching by getting on with it early enough so that it becomes a pleasurable experience. So I enjoy the actual day-to-day -day business of, of creating um, rather than feeling that it's all about honoring a deadline, tick, another one done, you know. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I suppose most of my compositions in the last few years have been more educational um, in the sense that, um, you know, I've, I've written various pieces that go on exam syllabuses and in, in various um, sort of compilation uh, books, albums of kind of pieces and duets and that kind of thing. And I really enjoy doing that because um, unlike a lot of compositions, I'm almost guaranteed more than that first performance syndrome, you know. I mean, can you imagine writing a symphony, spending five years on it, and hearing a sort of amateur orchestra do one, you know, decent performance of it, mm. and then it kind of never gets another airing? I mean, that's that's the reality for a lot of composers. Yeah. Um, whereas I will get to write, say, a grade six piece, um, and hopefully it will be on the syllabus somewhere, and thousands of people will be playing it in Pakistan or New Orleans or, you know... Um, so it, that, that, that kind of thing is it ma makes my composing life, I suppose, a bit more kind of real world um, than, it, than it might be from more sort of elevated real composers. I, I sometimes feel a bit of a charlatan with, with composing I, because I don't, write, I don't write piano concertos and symphonies. Um, I write mostly character pieces, you know. If you look at all the pieces I've published and virtually everything I've written has been published, I'm very fortunate in that way. Um, the average length of a piece I've written is probably three and a half, four minutes, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, to, to that extent, I, I can have lots of little ideas and allow them to come to something and then they stop. Uh, you know, writing a feature length piece requires you to be much more um, long term in your view and much more interested in the structure and integrity of the piece and all that kind of stuff. I tend to just have an idea, write the piece, let it explode on the page and hopefully make it a meaningful experience for people when they when they play it. And for me, that's that's the contract between the composer and the, and the player and the listener, you know, engaging, really. So as long as I keep doing that, I'll, I'll keep enjoying it and let the commissions roll in. <laughs> no, no, it's fantastic. Uh, I just, actually, I wanted to understand, how did you get into composing? Um, I suppose I've always, I've always felt as though I am a composer. I mean, and it started with improvising. I was lucky when I was first studying to have teachers who were very open to the idea of improvising and creating. And they, they reminded me of the fact that in the 19th century and earlier, um, musicians, a, a musician with a capital M was somebody who came at music from, a, from multiple um, And this pinholing that we tend to do, you know, I studied composition at college or I studied the flute at college or whatever um, is quite um, disabling in a sense because it, it discourages us from seeing the commonalities and the connections between things, um, more of the differences. And of course, you know, um, if, if you're a composer and a player um, and you understand a bit about the history and you understand about theory, all of these things kind of triangulate and before you know it, you're, you're thinking like a composer. I mean, literally 10 minutes ago, I was giving somebody a lesson online. Um, but we were talking about um, thinking like a composer. We were doing a Debussy arabesque. And I was saying, you know, think a little bit more as Debussy might have thought when he was putting, coupling up these harmonies. Um, was it a random process? Was he thinking like a pianist as well as thinking like a composer? Yes. And there, therefore, we as learners of those pieces need to also be doing that. Um, so... This is a kind of long-winded way of saying really that I've always felt that the compositional instinct was planted in me by those who were trying to teach me the piano in a much more holistic way 
than is perhaps conventional. And so for me, doodling on the piano, writing my own little piece on the basis of a bit of Mozart that I was supposedly learning, um, was the most inevitable and obvious thing imaginable. I never saw it as a, a contradiction of um, making my left hand even for the Alberti bass that I was learning in this piece of Mozart or whatever. It was never a contradiction. It was a reinforcement of the same musical energy that I think streams through all of us. It's absolutely fascinating. But um, I, I also must say I'm reading about Mozart at the moment, one of his uh, bigger biographies. Mm. And I'm amazed everyone was was uh, had to improvise, you know, they had to. And they were brilliant and they were sort of assessed on that. And this is completely vanished for some reason. Yeah. Uh, my my my, yeah. my question is: Do you feel that um, you know being a composer helps you uh, to teach and also understand pieces better? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, one phrase that I use quite a lot with pupils, or when I'm you know um, adjudicating and so on, um, is that if you can play a piece and make it sound as though you wrote that piece, you composed it, then you've stepped very close to the heart and soul of what that piece is. Um, it's not that you're masquerading as being something you're not, it's just that you are a temporary custodian of that piece, you know, and all of the instincts that brought that piece into being in the first place are the ones that surely should be living in your own head and your own fingers when you're performing it. Sure. Um, rather than it feeling like a sort of bolt on, um, you know, you're, you're being, f showing fidelity to the score, if you like, yeah, yeah. or being authentic. Um, that's a bit like method acting for playing the piano, it seems to me. If you really want to sell Debussy, you have to become Debussy, yeah. you know? And sometimes I also feel that in the world right now, as we're speaking, how many people are there that are practicing bar 14 of Debussy's second arabesque? You know, are there billions? No, millions, thousands? There the, the probably are dozens. There might even be a hundred. Um, but they're not many. So those people are collectively custodians of that piece. They are keep, they're, they're keeping the flame burning, if you like, for that piece. Um, and so if you can imagine yourself to be not, not a sort of overly important character in this, but a, a protagonist in the ongoing success of that piece, then you're compelled to think like a composer. You're, you're holding the substance of that piece in your very hands. You know, you're in charge of its destiny. Um, and so... Of course, it's, the creative instinct has to be about uh, about being feeling like a composer, even if you never formally get round to, you know, plugging Sibelius into your computer and and, and fiddling around with, with harmonies. Um, you, you still need to think like that, and being able to think also, I think, as an improviser, is a hugely important thing. I mean, um, I, I love jazz. Don't get me wrong, I love jazz, um, and I improvise to to an extent on jazz. Uh, jazz sort of idioms um but i do feel that jazz to an extent has hijacked the whole instinct of of improvising you know if you said to somebody on the street a, a pianist um uh, do you like improvising almost inevitably within 30 seconds of them answering you they'll mention the word jazz mm. because it's synonymous now it wasn't synonymous in 19th century when jazz didn't actually formally exist in that sense improvising meant creating something um, out of nothing. It was going off piste with whatever you know about your instrument and whatever you know about yourself and, and bringing all these things together in a sort of harmonious way, in a kind of stir fry uh, creativity sort of thing. What's in the fridge? Oh, I've got some peppers and some tomatoes and some onions. I'm gonna create this. If I didn't have the onions, I would have created that. Isn't that really what improvising is doing on the piano? I mean, we, we know what we know. We have in our fingers what we have in our fingers. And the sum total of all of that um, becomes the improvising. Um, whereas if you were to do exactly the same thing with the same ingredients on a different piano, you might do something different because it's got a sweeter middle sound the pedal works in a rather different way at the top of the piano, or it seems more given to a, a, a kind of more gritty um, lower region of the instrument and so on. So that now is part of your stir fry. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, is any of this making any sense? It's, it's really just a kind of, it's my take on what creativity is really, I suppose. I'm kind of reinventing your question to fit what I want to say, I suppose. But yeah, really I'm thinking that, 
that, that, that playing, composing and improvising are not like geography, history and maths as we learn them in school. They're not, they're not three planks of um, independent thinking. They're one thing. And ideally, they all come together. Um, so in my life, I've tried my best to allow each of those plants to grow in the garden, you know, and, and to cultivate them. And sometimes they twist together and produce something which is kind of, um, you know, foreshadowing or um, aftershadowing something that existed next to it. Mm -hmm. so, it's, it's, it's brilliant and it's so compelling. And it, again, it's uh, just such a shame. It's uh, not a practice at the moment, but uh, no, I love improvising. Mm. I, I totally, uh, yeah. Uh, but um, look, it's also, we've touched a very interesting topic in our pre sort of conversation, little chat. Yeah. about you adjudicating online so that's mm. of course very interesting um you know now the whole world is online you you know you feel that you're in a parallel reality really <laughs> uh mark um i know that um you are also adjudicating online mm. how has this been for you this experience well it's only just started because to be fair i've only got the one uh, festival that i'm doing this year that's gone online um, I'd booked, been booked to do a couple of other ones that decided that it was just not going to be an appropriate solution. Um, but I've just been sent 110 uh, links to um, videos of people playing. Um, and I spent the first couple of hours yesterday um, in this very room with uh, headphones on, just listening to what I was doing. And all the way through, I was, I was having to have this little debate in my head, really, I suppose, about how would I be doing this differently if I was actually kind of face to face with this, this young person playing this bit of Mozart, whatever it is, you know? Um, and in some ways it's, it's um, an easier task and a more kind of immediate task because there is no engagement at all. Sure. You know, to that extent, you could say that the lack of engagement is almost a positive because I could just, I could just click play, I can write my stuff and it's gone. But of course, that chief advantage is also the chief disadvantage, because it, it means I don't get to see the whites of their eyes. You know, I don't get to, to I, I think when you were asking Anthony a, a similar question about um, about online teaching and so on, is that, you know, that interactivity is the, is the very core of what we do as, as musicians and teachers, isn't it? And if you take that away and you replace it with a digital version, it sort of sanitizes it and reinvents it. And so it becomes a question of how adequately can we repurpose it to feel that that child or the adult playing for you in, in, in a festival setting um, is giving a representative job. And how, how well can I give the impression at least that I, when I was watching the video or listening to the audio track, also engaging with it? But it, 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 from that point of view, I suppose it is a slightly fake experience because they never get to meet me. You know, I've, I've got them on video, but there's no video response of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps that would be a better way around it. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe in the future, I'll suggest that, that I will actually, instead of writing something, I will say, hi, Julia, I really enjoyed hearing your Mozart. Um, I thought it was terrific how you put the ornaments together. In fact, the, the cadences sounded so clear cut and, <laughs> and maybe just, Occasionally, I felt that the left hand was just got a little bit intrusive, particularly when you got to that little bit here, and then swivel around on the piano and play it. It's very nice. But maybe that's the solution. Yeah. You know, and then they get that. I don't know. Um, well, look, it's it's, but... it's wonderful that our <laughs> our series are a source of these ingenious ideas. <laughs> that... Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I, I shall patent that uh, as a solution. I mean, you know, it does mean that. Um, you kind of load up the internet with yet more videos going backwards and forwards between people. And I know that several, I think it was Ronan O'Hara, uh, who you were um, speaking to on one of your interviews that I watched, um, who said that he felt the, the solution to this was to kind of pre-record, send things to the, to the teacher. And then you've got a chance to kind of listen to it, watch it in advance, mm -hmm. and then give the benefit of your, your considered thoughts during yeah. the kind of lesson and that, that's certainly a, a good solution um particularly if you want the, the the whole performance to come together um and i totally agree with him on that and i know a lot of my colleagues subscribe to that that view particularly if you've got ropey internet yeah. um and as you've already 
discovered for yourself that the internet here isn't isn't so great. So from a live point of view, um, it kind of dances around that one. Um, but I, I would just put in a cautionary note to that, and that is that surely what we value the most when we are face to face is the interactivity, it's the overlaps, it's, it's the inconvenient um, interruptions, it's it's the feeling that I can go with something you've just done or said yeah. um, that wasn't scripted. Mm. Whereas it, we, we, our modelled behaviour, putting our hand up when we want to speak on Zoom, um, or waiting for waiting for the internet to catch up so the sound and the lips sync. So we, we now feel confident we can speak without interrupting them. Yeah. Um, or um, judging whether it's appropriate to be playing the piano at the same time as illustrating, which is something I, I personally, I, you know, I'm sure you do that all the time. Absolutely, you're absolutely. The piano, you're playing, and you say, and but of course here you want to voice the E flat, don't you? And whatever. Okay. You, you you feel that you can't really do that sort of thing. So it becomes a bit staged, you know, you speak, I speak. Um, so I, maybe I, I feel that we have to sort of look for ways in which online teaching and online festival adjudicating and online examining even um, can best harness our own personalities and the technology. And that means reinventing it to a certain extent. We can't just simply hope to make a, a, an online piano lesson or an online adjudication um, a virtual version of that because it, it will always fall short. You know, totally. yeah. the conversation we're having now would would be better if you were sat in this room and I could offer you another copy. It would be better. It's just it's true. It would be better, um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't value to what we're doing. Mm. Um, whether in the, in, the, in the longer term there we will be taking away all of these advantages and, and, and perhaps coming up as I just did on the hoop there with that um, alternative way of doing festival adjudicating, where we really do that or whether we just revert to type and just become, you know, we've, we've pressed the pause button and now normal life resumes and we forget everything we thought we'd learnt about online, <laughs> online behaviour because we... You know, thank goodness we don't have to do any more kind of thing. Mm. I don't know. I, I, it's it's going to be very interesting to see how that. Uh, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you what, what sure. you feel about that? Of course. Um, I mean, I don't have a straight answer. I think um, I think many find it uh, very challenging. And of course, exactly mm. what you mentioned, you know, this is just a lack of this human presence and energies. I find that I, it's like the energy exchange that it's not there. Um, mm. And, you know, if you want to get your point across, you, of course, also kind of trying very hard. That's I think many find online teaching, as you probably also, quite exhausting because there isn't that mm -hmm. energy kind of going between people. But how it will develop? I don't know. I think um, it's very strange time. I would. I've never thought it was is possible in the twenty first century that you know we wouldn't be advised to sort of do mm -hmm. what we used to do and sort of you know encourage to uh, kind of take care of ourselves so much that we really are not supposed to get out of the house now more, but we don't know where it's going. So we don't. We don't mm -hmm. know. But but um, no, Mark. It's it's really interesting these discussions. They, I'm sure, they're endless, and that's partly why we started this series. You know, to mm. have different ideas to share it with people, and hopefully, one can find answers from whatever. I mean, I'm sure you've talked so wonderfully. So there's a lot of encouragement for our listeners. But um, I would like to touch the subject since you mentioned already the subject of. Um, online uh, ABRSM mm. online um, mm. exams. I know that you are a moderator, a trainer, and of course the examiner. What's your view about that? Well, I'm to be honest, I'm absolutely thrilled that there's going to be the prospect of, the, if you like, the parallel universe mm -hmm. of, of online exams, because um, it's, it's a choice. And I think what we're, uh, I think the, the, the main message here is that there needs to be choice both for teachers, candidates, um, and, um, and, and also for, for the examiners who, who are not necessarily able to go out to these countries. If we, if we want to sustain the, the energy that you were just talking about um, in, the, in the exam milieu, then we have to be willing to kind of look beyond the obvious. Um, and so having an alternative that's online, I think, is, is, is a great idea. Only time can tell whether it's going to be seen as a sort of viable alternative um, 
to to what's currently been existing. I mean, the exam board's been around for 130 years, creating an exam, a sustaining a, a, an exam uh, um, model, which involves being face to face and testing certain things in a way that's possible to do when you're in the environment you are. Clearly, it, this poses huge challenges when you're suddenly asked to reconsider some of those things, mm -hmm. you know, um, and perhaps to test in a different way, not because the test isn't valid, valid anymore, but simply because it's not really as, as, as kind of sustainable in an online way. Yeah. Um, uh, examiners are not hugely in the know, as it were, more than the general public in terms of what's about to unfold in terms of sure. the, the, the practical assessments. Um, but I feel that it's a, a lovely thing to have an idea where you can go along and as a performer, just perform you know I play the trombone and therefore I'm going to come and play the trombone to you um, I'm, I'm not particularly excited about doing skills um, my sight reading is not particularly brilliant and I'm not quite sure what a, an imperfect cadence is but I do play the trombone so having an alternative exam where, where, whereby it's possible to put all your eggs in that basket as it were for a, a, a performance exam I think is, uh, is a great idea um, and in a sense, it kind of um, uses the same logic as the ARSM, which has been a terrifically successful um, exam that we we instituted, what, 2017, I believe, three years mm -hmm. ago, um, whereby, again, it's an all eggs in one basket approach, you know, um, and it's kind of taking that logic and moving it, extending it into the grades. Sure. So I'm very excited to see how that works and whether it helps certain people in certain countries to be able to enjoy that experience and benefit from it, um, time will tell. Um, but we, we, we can't stand still in this environment any longer. And I think being aware of the carbon footprint that exam boards um, have as they move their teachers, their, their examiners around the world, mm -hmm. um, does need a regular appraisal. I don't, I, the extent to which it's necessary or unnecessary is, 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 is quite a deep ethical, philosophical one. And I don't have an answer to that, but I do think one way in which we can at least get a conversation going about how to address this sort of thing um, is to create a viable alternative within the realm of possibilities that we have um, using using recordings, using the Internet wherever possible. Um, and we'll see where it takes us. Maybe this whole lockdown thing has encouraged us to think a bit outside the box um, and to, to, to imagine actually dare i say it an equally horrible situation arising in five years time you know we, we need to we need to have the maturity to at least imagine and anticipate this for the future um and do we want to be stuck in a situation where we can't do any examining we can't do any teaching we can't do any festival adjudicating because the real world has stopped and we're now in a virtual reality yeah. you know either we accept that or we use our ingenuity and we try to rip things as, as imaginatively as we can um, so that we keep these doors open for people. Yeah, sure. Um, fascinating. And of course, I know that you are also a trustee of EPTA, as well as some other of mm. my um, interviewees. Um, so um, what is EPTA now trying to do? How is it helping um, the sort of teachers and musical community? Well, we're doing our best to do exactly what I've just been saying in terms of exams, really. Um, it's, a, it's a continuation of that thought, which is to respond to the here and now pressures and stresses and tension points that um, the teachers are experiencing. Um, and, you know, as trustees of, of, of EPTA, we are, of course, also teachers. We are also every day experiencing both the liberation, the liberating aspects of being in lockdown mm -hmm. and the... The, the feeling of being hemmed in or robbed of certain things and, and practices that we, we were, um, you know, accepting as, as, as having done. So EPTA is trying its best by means of webinars, uh, by means of, of looking into how we can evolve our website in a more interactive um, way, um, and by just hopefully being just that little bit more listening and engaging with our with our teachers um, to. To, to, to make them feel supported. I mean, what on earth are we doing if we're not supporting the teachers who are out there? I think Anthony Williams said to you the other day, you know, a good ambition for EPTA would be 
for us to have every culture out there wanting to be part of it. You know, the question shouldn't be, why would I join EPTA? It should be, why wouldn't I want to be part of EPTA? Yeah. Because it's it's not a union. It's not um, an echo chamber for piano, piano teachers. It's a support mechanism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there precisely um, to give opportunities for people to, to ask questions that that are difficult for them, but important for them to have an answer to. And if they don't get an answer, at least they can have the sense in which it's being taken seriously and sure. discussed um, and alternative points of view are being put forward. And, and I, I see the sky as being the limit actually with EPTA. It's a very exciting organisation. It's been around for 40 odd years, but it's, it's in, in many ways still got lots of growth potential, you know, mm. Maybe there was a time where it became a little bit pot bound in the sense that um, it became too kind of um, satisfied with its own accomplishments, if you like. But I think we've moved away from that some years ago um, and we're much more kind of interested in evolving and being part of a genuine experience, which is going to be useful for mm. teachers and long may it continue. I'm very proud to be part of the organisation. Um, Mark, so a really um, a last question, which consists of two parts. So okay. what would be your advice, uh, firstly, to young, inspiring uh, pianists um, who are left without performances? And also, what is your advice um, to teachers who are struggling in this time? Okay, so, um, well, I would say in terms of being rob sort of um, robbed of the performance opportunity, a, there are lots of performance opportunities that do remain online. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, whether it's something like the, the adjudicating that I'm just doing now for the festival, uh, where you just stick your iPhone on the on the edge of your of the table and record yourself, that's still a performance opportunity. Um, there are Zoom concerts and, and Zoom piano clubs that have happened all over the country, um, and they can they are showing lots of ingenious ways of allowing people to feel that there is a performance opportunities so i wouldn't necessarily agree that we are robbed of those we're robbed of the the collegiate sense of being in the same room um you know um and being able to applaud perhaps in in, in a way that gives us that sense of community and support for, for the pupil so it does feel a bit more sterile um, but the performance opportunities are still out there. So that kind of answers your second question as well, really, the second part of it, which is how, how a teacher might go about doing that. Um, just by using what te technology there is and encouraging pupils um, to feel that they're performing. That there's another sort of aspect of this, which is a bit more philosophical, is that in my view, when you're practicing at home or playing a piece through at home, you are, in a sense, practicing performing anyway. So I like to think that there are two sorts of piano practice or, or, or time that we spend alone. We're practicing practicing and we're practicing performing. Oh. So we're, we're, we're practicing the art of, of splitting things down into a million little bits and pieces and playing the one hand on its own and changing rhythms and slow practicing and all that stuff. That's practicing practicing. And then we're practicing performing, which is practicing gluing everything together, you know, like an actor standing in front of a mirror and delivering a whole succession of lines, imagining an audience. So a performance only becomes a performance when you're doing that second thing. And the whole point of the first stage is it links to the second stage. And, and therefore the audience becomes almost irrelevant to that. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you're imagining an audience when you're performing through to yourself, then you're getting many of the advantages that you would get, even if they were there. You know, when I'm practicing for a recital, I imagine the audience is there. I'm not going to pretend it's the same as them being there. And the sense of nerves and occasion, of course, is not the same. But it's actually remarkably similar in a lot of times. I don't know about you, if you've ever sat, if, if I said to you, I want you to just, just record a great five piano piece, would you? You know, there's a microphone, um, no problem. The fact that there's no audience in the room wouldn't mean you're less nervous. Yes. You might be more nervous. I've been at my most nervous when I've been recording things, mm -hmm. CDs and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's only me and, and, a, and a producer and, and somebody else in the room. And I'm still feeling nervous. So actually, th th this idea that when you video yourself recording for an exam, for a lesson, for a festival, that um, it's not really a, a representative sample of that person's play because it, they don't have the nerves, I think is actually flawed thinking. So, you know, you're still performing. You're still performing to yourself. You're performing to your cat. 
who are performing to the milkman, who listens to the last three bars of what we're doing. Yeah, th th this, uh, this pupil of mine was saying that she had, uh, she was just practicing and she had the window open and she didn't realize, but the gardener was working some distance away um, and came up to the window near towards the end of the lesson, uh, towards the end of her practice session and said uh, how much he'd enjoyed um, hearing her play. And she didn't even know that he was there at that point. So was that a performance or not? I mean, it was a performance in the sense that she was trying to perform to herself and the gardener received the, the, the end product of that. So that's a communication. It's a valuable experience. Um, even if it's not one that's Wigmore Hall with 500 people there. Sure. It, it, it's, it's, still, it's still about giving of yourself, engaging with the music and um, trying to be a transporter of the, the qualities of that piece, whatever it is you're playing, um, to other people. And I think you can, you can really get quite close to that on your own. Um, and also when you're sort of going through some you know, more slightly more contrived um, on online version of that um, to to make it useful for a for a lesson or for a, a festival or an exam or whatever it is. If you're thinking like a performer, then you're gaining the value of of playing like a performer. You know, that's the key to it. It's about what's going on in your head and in your heart and in your fingers, not the limitations of a of a microphone like this that I've got plugged in. Um, and, and, and how that's only giving one dimension to, to who I am, you know. So I try and think of it in terms of the opportunities these things present to you rather than the limitations that they, that they um, also give. Fantastic. Well, that was Mark, uh, Mark Tanner. And thank you, Mark. It was just so refreshing and full of energy. And thank you very, very much for your thoughts. Uh, fantastic. Well, thank you. For, thank yeah, you. Thank I very you much, much enjoyed meeting no, you it, online. It's absolutely lovely. And thank you. And um, I'm sure our listeners are delighted with your ideas. Thank you again. Thank you.